We talked about uh, prefix sums last time. I just defined the problem and uh, asked the, the Pingo question how you would solve it uh, sequentially. Uh, but to briefly bring you back on the same page, the definition of the problem is as follows. You are given an array of integers like this one. And then the output should be for every position in the output, you sum up everything that's to the left of that position in the original array, including the current position. And so for this position, it's summing up all these. For the first position, it's just the first entry. And while well, the last uh, cell in the output will always be the sum of the entire array. So as a subproblem, we solve the very complicated computational task sum of all those numbers. I promised you we can do it in linear time, and the code is very, very simple. And the trick is to always use the currently uh, computed prefix sum up to the i minus 1 position, and then just add one more number. That gives you the next bigger prefix sum. And that way, you can compute all those prefix sums in essentially the, the time you would have needed to compute the, just the sum of all the numbers. <laughs> the problem with this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's fine. It's the way to do it sequentially. Um, it's fast. It's in place, by which I mean you overwrite the input array. And afterwards, you have the output in the, same, in the same memory space. You could also copy it first. So working in place is always a good thing, because if you need it out of place, you can still copy it and do it in place on the copy. But sometimes it's tough to do it in place. We'll do it in place. That's the way to go if you want to do this sequentially. A single processor, and you wait till it's done. It's hard to parallelize this specific code because every step depends on the data from the previous step to be ready. So it seems there's nothing we can really speed up. Uh, so we need a slightly different approach. And let's simplify the problem even further. So forget about all those other partial <laughs> sums. Let's just take the sum of the entire array, the last entry in the prefix sum array. That's almost as simple as it can get. Uh, and it's, it's just summing all those numbers up. Of course, we can do it with this algorithm. Uh, but maybe you can think of other ways to do it. This algorithm corresponds to this tree representation of summing the numbers. You sum the first two, and then you add the third. You take the result of that and add the fourth, and so on, until you finally have the total sum. If you want another way to do it, you might as well take this binary tree and balance it. Well, ba balanced trees are always fancy. It's nice to draw them. But uh, why would that help us? The, the trick is that we can compute this sum, and this sum, and this sum, and this sum all independently. They don't depend on each other anymore. And then we can go to the next level. We can compute the result that's represented by this node and this node also independently, because they don't depend on, on each other's outputs. So what we do is uh, we simulate this tree level by level bottom up. And we can do all computations on the same level in parallel, because they don't depend on each other. OK? That these two things give the same result for the for the total sum of the array, that's uh, a nice feature of addition, uh, which is it's called associativity. You can change the way you break a long sum into binary sums by putting parentheses in. I mean, OK, just to be very sure that we are all understanding this, uh, a term like this, I can compute this by first summing up the first two, or I can first sum up the last two, and then add the one. OK, very basic stuff. Addition is associative. Because it, it's, because it is associative, you can regroup the computation like this. I'm stressing this baby math uh, exercise here. Because you can replace the sum by other operations, as long as they have the same abstract property that you can put parentheses in whatever way you like, you can use the same algorithms that we use for the prefix sums to also solve these more complex problems. 
<coughs> but for now, let's uh, stay with the simple sum version. So one remark I, I didn't really stress so much. Uh, no matter how you structure the tree, the total work you're doing, the number of operations, the number of binary additions, that won't go away and it won't change. It's always n minus 1 internal nodes if you have n leaves in a binary tree. But the depth of the tree, the height of the tree, I should really say, so I don't like this terminology. Uh, a tree has a height. A node can have a depth in a tree. That's fine, but the tree has a height. The height of the tree is the parallel time because, as I said before, we will simulate the tree level by level going up. So the number of steps is the height. OK, let's put this into actual code. Uh, but first, do the example. OK, OK. Um, I don't show you code for the simple version. Coding up this is almost the same as coding up the full prefix sum version. Remember, this only gives you the sum of the entire array, but we wanted all the partial, all those prefix sums to also be computed. So we'll do both in one shot. The idea to do all of those sums at the same time is to essentially do what, we just, what we've just seen for one sum, uh, replicated many times, but reusing the partial results that overlap. This is the way to understand what I'll show you in hindsight. It's easier to understand what I'll show you now by just looking at the picture. Uh, it's just not clear maybe at first why it's the right thing to do. We'll proceed in rounds. And the rounds will always, uh, for every position in the output, they will add up two things. And the first thing that they add up is just they copy what's in the same cell. And then they add to that some number that's further to the left in the input. And in round one, we copy at distance 2 to the 0, a fancier way of saying 1. That means in the result, already the first position is the correct partial prefix sum, the correct prefix sum of the first entry. It's just the first entry. For the next round, we double this, uh, this distance where we copy. It's now 2 to the 1. And after that round, the first two entries will be correct. Why is this entry correct? Well, uh, well, OK, this was already correct the first time. Uh, this one. This one should contain the sum of all those three. It was just computed as the sum of this one and the first one. But this one was not the original input array anymore. It was already the sum of those two elements. So in total, the 3 here is really the sum of the first three elements of the array in the, before we started. We keep doing this, always doubling the distance from which we fetch the second element. And we know when to stop, namely when, well, when this, then the next skip would be the entire array. And if you now pick out a single of those elements and, well, uh, look a bit sideways maybe, you can see that this is the very same balanced binary tree that we've had in the slide before. It's just drawn a little weird because those are aligned on that same spot. But if you were to shift this to the middle and shift this, etc., it's the same binary tree. And we have this binary tree. Uh, as part of all those little arrows for every of the positions here. And well, if it's one of the positions here, we actually didn't need the last level because then the uh, sum that we computed is less than half of the array. Then we can actually start on this level. So if you pick the 15, for example, you see the binary tree for the 15 if you just start looking here. All right. By proceeding in these rounds, we automatically had the feature that the, the parts of the tree that were the same were not computed many times, but just once. Many trees will, compute, will use this node. That was a bad example. Not so many will use this node. Uh, let's, let's pick this one. 
Uh, many trees will use the results stored in this node, but it's only computed once in this first round. So we save a lot of effort by proceeding in these rounds and doing things a little, a little smarter than uh, you, might, you might do if you do the trees in isolation. OK? Procedure is clear. You start with the array in each round, take what you currently have and add something that's further to the left. And how far to the left? Well, power of two of the number of rounds, of the round number. We can write this in code. And I guess if, uh, if you just look at the code, this looks deceptively simple. I guess in the picture, it became clear what actually happens. The code is very simple again, uh, but maybe uh, contains a few subtleties. The outer loop goes through the rounds. And we'll have roughly log n of these. We have to round up. I'll figure out the details on your own. Then we compute the step size. That's how far we jump back. And then comes the new interesting uh, piece of pseudocode that you might not have seen. We have another for loop. And if you forget the red part, we would just have uh, a correct operational sequential program in which we would take uh, the thing that's a uh, step many positions to the left and add it to the current position. And now we just say, OK, everything in this loop, all iterations of this loop can be done in parallel. And we leave it to, well, the parallel random access machine or whatever, uh, if you prefer, the operating system to figure out how to schedule this to the actual cores. So we're abstracting in this, in this step from, um, from the hardware for sure. But even threat programming does that. But we're going even a step further. We don't even say uh, which of those jobs should, should run on what on what core, in what order. We just say, here's a bunch of jobs. You can run all of those in parallel. Please do it. It's a declarative way of parallel programming. OK, uh, I, I guess I told you a lot about this code now. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, so in the following, we will use these, these type of, of constructs for parallel programming. Mostly, it will be a for loop, because you can use inside this for loop, you can, uh, well, you could, in this case, if you assume we have one processor for each entry in the array, and they're numbered p0 up to whatever the size is, pn minus 1. Uh, you could explicitly say, uh, please, processor num processing element i, please uh, execute this step. Um, that's the proper way to do it as a PRAM program, if you ask the, the purists there. I think that already is far away from hardware, so many processors. So why bother? We can take the little more abstract point of view. Just do these in parallel and don't obsess too much which processing element does it. One important thing here that I didn't talk about is we have to be very sure we're uh, working in place. We're overwriting the array in each round. Unlike in the picture I showed you where I copied the array, what this code really does is overwriting the same input. We have to be very sure that all those reads in this positions, the reads always come before all the writes from all the other processing elements. OK? Because they have to all read the value from the previous round before they write the value for the next round. And that's the, the part that in, in current threat-oriented languages you would have to do yourself. You would have to make sure that this doesn't cause conflicts, that one processor jumps ahead of the others, already writes his value, and another would have liked to read the old value, but that one's gone. So that's the simplifying assumption on PRAM. And this is, this is pseudocode. It's a little 
simplified so that we can read it better. In the machine type of code that I've shown you in unit one, this would actually be read that into a register, read that into a register, add the results into another register, and write the register content back to memory. If you do it in that, if you spell it out as these individual uh, instructions, and you, you add that all those on all the processing elements are executed at the same time, then all the reads are done at the same time, and all the writes are done at the same time, and there's no, no way how they could get out of sync. Okay, let's briefly look at this, uh, this little algorithm and analyze it. Uh, remember we had, well, for traditional sequential algorithms, you have time and space as the, the main measures of, of, com of cost. Uh, we have space again, but it's in place, so it doesn't really use any extra space. But for time of a parallel algorithm, we have these, these two uh, units that are essentially incomparable, uh, time or span and work. And uh, time, well, we do everything that's in this for loop in parallel. So the total execution, t execution time of this for loop is just constant. Any, any uh, individual loop iteration is constant time, just a bunch of uh, reads and additions and writes. And they're all in parallel. So this is constant time. parallel time. And the rest here also. So what we have is we run a loop that has logarithmic number of iterations, and each body takes constant time. That gives us logarithmic time in total. OK, this simply says it's best possible. If you think about this uh, addition tree again, as long as you only allow adding up a constant number of, of numbers in each round, you can't get better than that because you have to somehow branch all, get from n things down to a single thing that needs a log n uh, depth in, in any tree. For the work, we don't uh, summarize this as order one, but we would just ignore the, sequen the, the in parallel here and execute it sequentially. And then this loop has uh, linear work because any of those, well, it's n iterations roughly. And they each take constant time. So it would be order n work. I should say theta, really. Uh, this doesn't add much. That's just a, a single instruction. But then we do this log n times. So the total amount of work is n times log n. And this means uh, what we have here is not a work efficient algorithm, because we could do the same problem in linear time on a single processor with a different algorithm. So I thought I had that, OK, more than the sequential algorithm you've seen. And for some more complicated problems, this is an inherent trade-off. It's hard to get the work of a, sequen of a good sequential algorithm while at the same time being um, exploit the parallelism. But it turns out for this simple problem, we can actually get the best of both worlds. And there's different ways to do it. Uh, but um, what I want to show you is this, uh, this last part. If we're uh, ignoring constant factors, we can get the work to linear time without blowing up the, the span or the, the parallel time by more than a constant factor with a standard trick that um, works for other types of parallel problems as well. So I, I think this one's more useful for you to know. Uh, 
Um, forget about the analysis for a moment. The idea is to, to take this work inefficient algorithm, which is fine in terms of how it parallelizes things, but it does a little too much work while it's doing that. And don't run it on the full problem, but rather just on a smaller reduced problem. I think before I go through the details, let me do an example of why that could work. Um, I don't want to mess up the additions, so I'm just using a, sing a very simple array. It's all ones. OK, if I add that, you don't see anything. It's an array of ones. So the final result should be 1, 2, 3, and so on, whatever it is, 12. Now I'll choose a block size, say 4 in this case. And I divide my array into blocks of that size. Oh boy, can't count. Here's the 12. OK, blocks of four numbers each. Let's uh, define it like that. Then uh, we'll try to do the following trick. Uh, the overall time of the algorithm was log n. So we can spend some time in a sequential algorithm first, as long as it's only log n steps. In the general case, we will choose this b to be log n. So I can work on something that takes time size of b, roughly, and then start my work inefficient algorithm. And I don't pay more than a constant factor overhead. So here's, here's what I do. I, uh, I work on those blocks in isolation. I compute the local prefix sums. So one processor goes through this block and adds the numbers up, computes the local prefix sums. One processor does this. The second does this. And another one could do it for the last block. OK? That takes order b time on n over b processors. So the total work is linear. Because we've touched every element roughly once. Now from this, I will pick out just the rightmost elements in each, in each of those little blocks. And I will compute the prefix sums just over those with a slow algorithm. So we run our, well, it's not slow. It's work inefficient, I should say. So that's the, we built all those binary trees, et cetera, go by doubling steps through the rounds. So that would give us 4, 8, and 12. And we ignore all the other entries in the array. Now, uh, how much do we pay for this? Uh, we pay log n time. That was already all, um, optimal in the, in the original case. And we ignore that the input is a little smaller. But how much work do we pay? Well, it used to be n log n work. But now we reduced our input size. n is now n divided by log n. OK. Uh, let me write this as n prime log n prime. But n prime is n over b. And that's roughly n over log n. <laughs> if you insert that here, the log n just cancels. And what happens inside the log doesn't matter. You can check this. OK? So what we did, we took an algorithm that was time efficient but had, did too much work in over, overall. We spent some time reducing the instance just so much that the work inefficient algorithm does only linear work, which is what we're aiming for at the end. And it solved the problem partially for us. 
uh, we're still not done because uh, these, these other elements are missing some of the sums. But that we can again fix like in the first phase. In each of these blocks, well, the first one is actually all right, so nothing has to happen here. But in each of these other blocks, the processor one again, it adds the four to each of those positions. Right, it uh, <coughs> copies this down and adds the four, which is well, the blue uh, rightmost element reduced, <laughs> prefix some of these guys. And a last processor does it for these. OK, I wish I had left here a bit more space. But what's the work in time for this again? It's the same as in the first phase. Uh, we only touch every element once, so it's linear work. And it's order B time, because it's uh, the sequential part is just confined to a single block. That's the idea of the algorithm. Um, in a little more concrete ways of, of uh, spelling it out, this is the same thing. Uh, we start with a certain block size. We define those blocks, and then uh, call our inefficient algorithm, and then produce the output to the full input and the analysis we already did. OK, so that's a standard trick that often works. You have an algorithm whose parallel time is good, but it's work inefficient. Look for a way to reduce the instance to something smaller and then apply it and try to fix it up afterwards. <coughs> We're still in the, in the chapter on sorting, but we haven't done any sorting today. We're one step ahead of, uh, one step of, of, uh, away from coming back to that. But I need a second primitive. So the first one was prefix sums. And the second one is this. Suppose you have an array with some entries, say numbers. That's A. You also have an array B that is just a bit vector. And it tells you uh, some of those positions are interesting and the others I actually would like not to see anymore. The goal is to compact this subsequence of the array. So a subsequence is any subset of positions. I'd like to have an array that only has the elements with a 1 above them, and the others should be gone. Again. Sequential algorithm is very simple. You just run through this array. Whenever you see a one, you copy it to your output, and you increment uh, an index. Linear time sequential, very simple. But we want to do this in parallel. OK? And the answer is actually use prefix sums. If you compute the prefix sums of this bit vector b, uh, maybe we can just do this here. This will be 1, then we will have 1s, 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 but I'm not actually interested in those. The interesting part is that at the positions where I have a 1, I now have almost the indices in the output just a, a shift by one. So I take the three, I take, I write the three at the position prefix sum of b minus one. That's this minus one. And the, the b now is the green part because the prefix sum has overwritten the original b. Okay. So one more time, you compute the prefix sums of just the b vector. That gives you the green thing. Then you iterate over the entire array, but you do this in parallel. So again, you assume there's a single processor waiting at each of these cells in the array. And then many of those processors don't actually do anything. If their bit is 0, they do nothing. If their bit is 1, though, they take 
whatever was in their position, they take their element and put it to the appropriate position in the output. Puzzled faces? Kind of clear? We essentially use the prefix sums so that all the processors locally know where, uh, where they have to write their element to. That's the whole magic. Where again, the sequential algorithm, if, if you think about it, how it works uh, walking through the array one element at a time, it actually computes the prefix sums of those bit vectors implicitly by maintaining the next output index that it writes to. Uh, and it's, it computes this prefix sum again with the sequential algorithm. And now we just replace this part by the parallel one. And the other part is actually not changed. OK, time for you to wake up. Uh, I think I want you, that wasn't what I wanted. I want you to answer this question for me. Just have to find it. There you go. All right, this is hard to read. Uh, that should be the right one. Logarithmic time and linear work, which is exactly inherited from the prefix sum problem. So that's the right answer. And I, I probably have to go back to the code to explain why. Well, that's precisely the prefix sum part. So you would just have to check that the rest doesn't contribute more than that. Uh, who can tell me what the parallel time for this for loop is? For executing the whole for loop lines two to four? Quadratic, exponential, logarithmic, constant. Yeah, parallel time is constant because the loop is constant. And well, we do it in parallel. That's the whole thing. That's the whole goal. And work is linear because it's just n times a constant. Goody. So we can do prefix sums in essentially optimal time and work in parallel. And we can also do compacting subsequences, copy out an arbitrary subsequence from an array and uh, copy it in a compact way into another array. <laughs> 